For those of you who see me bathed in radiance, it's not my halo. I've got these <laughs> spotlights that just been erected here. Because our Buddhist society, instead of building a new big hall to accommodate all the people, we are taking the temple to you. We're putting this, um, these talks on a camera and trying to put them on the, the web, on video streaming. Which means that sometimes, maybe in the future, if you can't come here one evening, you can stay at home and you can see it live on the web. Friday Night Live, we're going to call it. <laughs> With Ajahn <Brahm. laughs> So that's what these lights are. So if you can find a space, sometimes that people have to come more early. In a few years' time, I can see people queuing up here on a Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock to try and get their space. <laughs> anyway, once everybody's settled in and found a space, we're going to start this evening's talk. And the subject of this evening's talk, many of you may have, at least I hope some of you, saw that in Tuesday's paper there was a little quote from me because see, just after we did an ordination ceremony at our monastery, my monastery at Serpentine, I keep on calling it, calling it a monk factory, and we were in full production last Monday, creating three more monks. But just after the ceremony, there was a telephone call, and what had happened, some of uh, the senior people of religion in Sydney had started talking about the tsunami being a wrathful act from above to punishing the unbelievers or the sinners in our community. And so they wanted to get all the other, give all the other people, leaders of religion, a chance to say their peace. And so they asked me to also say, what does a Buddhist say about this? Is this tsunamis? Is this punishment from above for not going to the temple? <laughs> Is it because you haven't been keeping your five precepts? Is it because you're being stingy when you walk past a donation box? Is it because you've been arguing with your wife or your husband? Is it? <laughs> so <laughs> this evening's talk is all about the Buddhist idea of like reward and punishment, especially on these big things. Because sometimes when I was asked that, I said, "Oh, come off it! You can't actually. You know, if there is a God, you won't sort of criticize. No God in his right mind would do things like that." And you can't just blame karma, because that's sometimes pretty mean. So what actually is happening? And uh, I think you heard me say last week about uh, <laughs> this. I told this to the, uh, the newspaper reporter, but he didn't put it in the article. But it's a lovely little story, which I think I mentioned last week. I'll just repeat it again. It's just when you were, uh, came from the time when there was a man came to see my teacher, Ajahn Chah. He'd been wounded, he'd been shot. They said, oh, why did it happen to me? Why do I have to be wounded? Why do I have to sort of not be able to use my arms so well anymore? It's unfair, I've had bad luck, I was shot while I was in the army. And that damn child called him a fool, an idiot, what do you expect? That's what happens when you join the army. You know, people actually shoot bullets at you. <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it, when you put it that way? It's in the contract, if you read the fine print, in the bottom here is joining the army, some people will shoot bullets at you, and some of those bullets must hit. And that's also, so he said, what are you being complaining about? You joined the army, you got wounded. <laughs> if you didn't want to get wounded, you shouldn't have joined the army. It's the same when you join the human race. You chose to join the human race, according to Buddhism, you decided to take birth in this body. So, you, it's in the fine print. Didn't you read the contract before you took birth? <laughs> It's in the contract that sometimes you can get killed by a tsunami, by an earthquake, by AIDS, by cancer, by heart attack, by a road accident, by old age. Heaps of ways to get killed. And it's all in the fine print. If you didn't read it, it's no, you can't. <laughs> so it's not punishment at all. This is like nature. When we understand nature, there's no idea of like punishment, but also the, the whole idea of punishment in our culture is something which is, if anything, is an anathema to me. It's the whole idea of like punishing. And because I know that for a fact, any psychologist would agree with me that punishment very, very rarely works. And why do we want to punish somebody anyway? It just 
any wise person would never ever administer punishment because there's much better ways of you know, getting the ends which you really desire. Because if someone's done something bad, evil, wrong or whatever, first of all, I mean people aren't basically evil, they're a bit silly sometimes and stupid. But it's not, that's why in Buddhism they say the root of all problems is not evil, it's stupidity. That's why sometimes people actually ask me when, you know, when Mr. Bush said his um, favorite, his, um, I was going to say sermon, <laughs> but I meant his, uh, his speech on the axis of evil. And someone asked me, do you have such a thing in Buddhism, the axis of evil? I said, no, we have the axis of stupidity. <laughs> it's <laughs> stupidity in Buddhism, not evil, because that stupidity is in each individual. It's not somewhere out there which sort of infects you. It's this human stupidity by not seeing clearly. And sometimes part of that stupidity is this terrible thing we have in our cultures called revenge. And because of revenge, that sort of t tends to justify punishment for many. Now you've hurt me, you've hurt my sort of um, community, or you know, you've hurt my family, therefore I've got to have revenge. I've got to get my own back. I've got to teach you a lesson. Because if I don't teach you a lesson, then you'll go and do the same thing again. That's what we think. We justify it by thinking that we're actually helping the situation by stopping this person from misbehaving a second time. But it doesn't work that way. And the point is anyway that that's not really the reason why we want punishment, why we want revenge. It's a more vindictiveness. We have a strange thing that when we hurt, we want other people to hurt as well. And it's something which I've seen so often. I've seen it in myself when I was a young monk. But also I've seen it in other people and it's a very nasty little thing to see. You actually see it all the time in relationships at home. And when you come back in the evening and you're tired, you take it out on your wife, your husband, whoever's right there. If you live alone, you take it out on your poor dog. You kick the dog. You scream at the cat. The poor cat hasn't done anything, but you're in a bad mood and you take it out on somebody. Why is it we do that? We're in a bad mood, we don't feel well. We take it out on the people we love. It's a crazy thing. I remember this uh, uh, lady, I haven't seen her for a while, but I really admired her. When I first went visiting in prisons, I went to the old Fremantle jail. It's a wonderful place to go in, in the sense it was very extreme. And uh, because it was extreme, there was extreme sort of uh, what we might call uh, depression, um, harm, oppression as well. There's also some incredibly wonderful people I met in there. And one of them was this lady, She was her name was Dasha Simkova. I sort of uh, misunderstood her name at first, called her Basha. And I said, wonderful name to be, you know, in working in prison, being a Basha. <laughs> it was Dasha, her name was. And she was uh, a Czech social worker. Her story was that she was a young girl that's 18 or 19, I forget which, in 1967 when the Russian tanks came into Prague to put down what was called the Velvet Revolution under Alexander Dubček. I remember that time. And she protested. She was an idealistic um, young woman protesting for the rights of her people, protesting for a bit of freedom. And she was one of the students who got caught by the Russians. And when you get caught in those days, there's no real trial. You go to jail, and you go to jail for many years. So she was put in a, in a jail in Prague, in an East European jail, for about 16 years or something, for protesting for her people. And she told me that the beatings were regular. There was no Amnesty International in those days in Eastern Europe. But she always told me at the time that when she was being beaten she would never allow herself to get angry at her oppressors. She said that's the one thing which they could not take away from her. Her freedom just to stand up for herself and not to allow them to hurt her emotionally. They could hurt her body, they could bruise it, they could break bones. But she would not allow them to hurt her mind. I understand that. That's why in my little book I sometimes put a little phrase which is very deep. Sometimes some of the stories and little phrases I throw out 
they sound a bit funny but they can be extended to such a profound depth of understanding and wisdom and compassion it's a little stay, saying never allow anyone else to control your happiness so she was not going to allow even a torturer to control her happiness she said my happiness is my business and you're not going to take that away from me she was an incredibly tough lady and that's why she said when any of the, the prisoners in Fremantle started to complain to her about the conditions in the old jail she said come over here and I'll tell you what a real jail is like and they always went away saying I'm never complaining again this is a wonderful place <laughs> compared to an East European jail even the privations of Frio jail when it was running <sighs> nothing like in the East of Europe but anyway she told me that eventually she was released from jail and when she first came out of that jail you know, it was amazing what it was like the sense of freedom all those years are now over the torture the pain is now gone admittedly she lost the best years of her young life when she went in a tram in Prague to go to her relations she was so upset that all the people in the tram were pushing her out of the way barging and being so unkind to each other and that shocked her she thought look we're all being oppressed by this terrible regime why aren't we at least kind to each other and then she realized and this is part of why I mentioned this story she realized because everyone was being so oppressed and it was too dangerous to protest or get angry at that regime at the time instead they took out their anger on each other they were unkind just to ordinary people because of the hurt they were feeling every day inside of themselves and it sort of made it very clear to me as it should make it clear to you that sometimes we want to punish other people because we're in pain ourselves we are hurting and we want other people to hurt as well that's called revenge and of course it just makes more hurt in this world and the pain just increases there is never a solution to happiness in this world but unfortunately that way of revenge and more punishment and more pain and more hurt just makes more tears this is probably why all the oceans are so salty but there's another way when I was a young Buddhist one of the things which really impressed me is there was never any idea of punishment at all in Buddhism even when you read the Dhammapada so the Buddha always said put aside the rod and put aside the punishing and when I saw just the way that he organized his community of monks even there there was no punishment at all instead there was the opposite called encouragement rather than pun punishment because sometimes we say that we need to punish in order to sort of get the best out of people but again when I was a young student I was always interested in psychology and science Psy psychology for me was the science of the mind but especially when I was a, a, a school teacher that was where the, you know, sometimes people were saying should you punish kids or should you encourage them what should you do because you have a class of kids there you've got to teach them sometimes there's some bad kids there's always a few troublemakers how do you deal with those situations the psychology lecturers always told me again and again and again that all the tests they'd ever done always showed that encouragement and praise always works much 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 better than punishments I know that sometimes people have told me in armies if they get to a young a private who's misbehaving who's creating a lot of trouble for other officers you promote him to being a corporal strange but it works it's standard army um, wisdom even in the army they understand that the point is that sometimes when you encourage a person and praise them you're getting on to a different level and they don't tend to misbehave anymore sometimes the reason is that why do people misbehave I've already said that because they're hurting inside they're in pain you just give them more pain they just hurt even more but instead of giving pain you give encouragement you give forgiveness you give love you give positive reinforcement 
And that obviously reinforces the positive qualities in them. They don't feel so bad anymore. They don't feel so upset, depressed, angry. They haven't got such a grudge against the world because people are kind to them. And they don't misbehave anymore. This positive reinforcement is the way I run my monastery. And ask the monks next to me, this is the way that I run things. And it always works. You encourage, you never tell people off. And I do that in a... Encourage you in a family as well. If you've got a kid at home who never does, never cleans his room up, who never does his studies, stays up late at night, is always just playing video games, blah, 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 whatever it is, whatever you don't like about him, find something, a small thing to praise about the guy or the girl. And if you start to praise the person, praise the good qualities. Now when he does tidy up, or when uh, she does sort of speak nicely to you. When you praise those good qualities, you'll find that those things will grow. Praise is almost always much, much stronger and more effective than any punishment. For those of you who are in a relationship, you try that. You know what it's like for you if your wife goes you know, nagging at you again and again and again and again and again. You now I've got this great idea for a business. If any of you are unemployed or you want to go to business, you should start this nagging tapes business. Where when you somebody's going overseas, you know, for a while and you're going to be separated from your loved one, so that you know you don't miss them, you can go to this little company and they will record your wife nagging, 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 nagging for maybe one hour. So when she's overseas visiting her relations, you can actually get that CD out, the nagging CD. And you can listen to your wife, nag, 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 nag. Or you can listen to your husband, complain, 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 complain. And then you won't feel so lonely anymore. You say, oh my goodness, thank goodness she's gone. <laughs> you can make a good fortune, nagging tapes. 10% to the Buddhist society for commission. <laughs> But why do we always speak to each other like that? It wouldn't it be much lovelier if we actually praised each other? You get much more out of each other through this positive encouragement, through rewards. That's why we do give rewards, book prizes, medals or whatever else it is. Because it rewards goodness and if it rewards goodness everybody else wants to get a piece of the action and get into this reward business. So we encourage good qualities. We don't punish, we encourage. And you find, that, as I said in this little book, that's what we call having a garden and watering the flowers and just ignoring the weeds. If you ignore the weeds and water the flowers, you don't water the weeds, you just water the flowers. You'll find those flowers grow, 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 grow. The weeds, because of lack of water, they'll just shrivel, shrivel, shrivel. You do that in your partner. Don't water his weeds. Or no, don't water her with, water the flowers. <laughs> so look, all the nice flowers, the nice things you like about them. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. Oh, it's so kind of you. Oh, you're just such a wonderful person. Oh, I really think that's very sweet what you've just done. And of course, they want to do it again. This is what we call like encouragement. So we don't actually punish. The whole idea of punishment is actually ridiculous to me. So if there was any being in any power, they would never be punishing people who are doing things wrong. They'd instead be encouraging people who do things which are right. That's one of the reasons I don't believe in a God, because if there was a God, they'd be encouraging me by giving me all the lottery numbers, lots <laughs> make us really rich and powerful. No, 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 of course not, I'm only joking. <laughs> now the point being is that you... In to encourage the good, that's actually what we really mean. It's never such a thing as a punishment. However, that why is it that perhaps you know, sometimes people do die? Why is it that people do get into difficulties? Why is it that even people like do go to hell? When I was in Singapore that somebody was asking me these questions about hell and heaven because they'd seen in these temples, and some of you may have gone to these Buddhist temples, and seeing some of these murals, you've seen some of these murals of hell, of these beings being boiled in boiling oil. Now the reasons why they had those, you know, those uh, pictures in the temples is because in those days they didn't have like horror movies, they didn't have TV, 
so they actually go to the temples you know, to scare themselves silly. It was, you know, there's original special effects. And some, <laughs> some of these artists used to really get into it, you know, boiling oil and being poked with uh, prongs and whatnot. But some, somebody asked me, was that what hell is really like over there? And I sort of uh, started actually developing this sort of answer to this sort of problem. You know, about hell and suffering and punishment and all that. Is there a hell? And I said, yeah, sure there is. Is it like that? I said, sure, it's not. But I remembered one of our members many, many years ago who came here. He had a very, very bad back pain, I think it was. I forget exactly, some degenerative disease of his back. And he was in extreme pain. And he was going to Osborne Park Hospital at the time. I remember him coming to talk to me because he was learning meditation. He became a very good meditator. I always remember the time, this was a long time ago when we used to have the old centre there. He came up to me one after a Friday night talk and he had this big smile on his face. He said, I've finally done it. I said, what have you done? Because it's nice when people come and tell me that I've finally done it. It's usually some meditation trick they've done. He said, I finally got the machine absolutely flat. But not the ECG. So that was easy. This is the EEG. Because <laughs> <he'd> been <laughs> he's been was uh, been looked after in this hospital, putting all these gadgets on him, and because of his great pain, he was actually forced to really meditate properly. And he can get into these very very deep states of meditation. And he said, you know, when he was having the um, being tested at the hospital, first of all he get the ECG measuring your heartbeat absolutely flat. But then after a little bit more training of his mind, you get the EEG, measuring your brain activity, absolutely flat. And then he looked back with a smile and said, see all those people in the back, they're all from Osborne Park Hospital, they're always coming to check you out to see what's going on in this place. <laughs> That's what he said, I've ever said that. But the reason I mentioned him was that because he, um, he told me that in the hospital at that time, they realised it was so difficult for people in such extreme agony all the time, to actually express how they felt to their loved ones and friends. You say that, I'm hurting, but what does that mean? It could be just you've got a little ache, or you know, a slight headache, or it could mean you're in incredible pain. So this hospital, I'm not sure if they still do this, somebody will maybe tell me afterwards, they did, just, uh, decided upon this like scale of pain by using metaphors. What they said for him, he said, your pain, and they can measure it on the machines, I'm not quite sure how, but they said, your pain, which you experience all the time, is exactly the same as someone would feel if you're having your hand sawn off, or your arm sawn off with a saw. So that's what you're feeling now. So he had some way of actually expressing it to his friends and loved ones. He said, look, this is what I'm going through all the time. It's amazing, when he said that, I realised, my goodness, that guy must be in incredible pain. And they had other standards of like you know, even more intense pain or less intense pain by comparing it to a normal person who's going through some of these horrendous experiences. Because how can you actually describe pain except by some sort of metaphor, by comparison to something which everyone can relate to? Now I understood from that experience why in some of those temple paintings they had such descriptions. These weren't meant to say this is what it's like. Absolutely. But it said this is the standard for telling you what pain is. It's not that you're going to be boiled in oil, but imagine if you were boiled in oil. That's sometimes what people can feel. Because of the pain. But where does that pain come from? Where does that feeling come from? And a lot of time it's like the pain of like guilt, revenge, hatred, inner anger. Because this is actually what the Buddha meant, it's like hell. I have this wonderful story, I'm not sure when I last told it, but I'm going to use it and going to extend it further. Because sometimes in talks you like to start with a simple story and then just see where it leads. There's a very famous story of the samurai warrior who wanted to find out whether there was a heaven and hell. And so he went to see this monk, who he admired and respected. He went to see the samurai. And so he went to see this monk, and the samurai said, Monk, venerable, so I come to ask you a question. You're supposed to be honest and wise, 
If you don't know the answer, just say so. At least be truthful, and I will just leave you alone. But don't sort of make it up. I can tell when people are just pretending to know. Is there a heaven or is there a hell? And just the monk just looked at him and said, You're too stupid to know. He insulted a samurai. And many of you would know that samurais are very proud warriors. They're not stupid, they're highly intelligent, and they go through immense amount of training. And he was offended. He said, Venerable Sir, I am not stupid. Answer the question. If you don't know, just tell me. He said, Listen, I don't answer questions to riffraff like you. Go away. He called him riffraff. Now this is like an elite soldier. And so he put his hand on his sword and said, Monk, if you're going to be like that, beware. This short sword is very sharp and I can cut off your head just with one swish. And the monk looked at the sword with that rusty old piece of tin. You couldn't even slice a piece of bread. And that was it. The samurai was just so offended. His pride had been so badly wounded. He got out his sword and was just about to swing it to slice off the monk's head. And the monk looked at him and said, Samurai, that's hell. Your anger, your state of mind, when you're upset and offended, about to cut my head off, that is what it's like in hell. The mental pain you're feeling now, that state of wanting to punish, wanting to be cruel, wanting to hurt, wanting to deprive someone of life, imagine that's going to be there, not just for one moment, for day after day, year after year, eon after eon. That's hell. Unfortunately, the samurai understood. I often say that monk was pushing his luck. <laughs> Perhaps because he did understand, he could tell the story afterwards. But certainly, the samurai understood and was saying, at last, at last I've got someone who is wise. It doesn't just tell theory and just all this you know, gobbledygook and gibberish and ask me to understand it. He doesn't go and say, it's written in the holy books. He's actually taught me something. Isn't it wonderful actually when you go and listen to someone and instead of like you know, teaching out of their head, they actually teach out of their heart from experience. So this samurai just went straight on the ground and he bowed, you know, tears streaming and said, oh at last I've found a master who can teach me. Oh, I'm so grateful to you, you wonderful monk. Oh, you're just so tremendous. Thank you so much. You're the Elvis of Buddhism. That's what someone said to me once. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and of course then the monk looked up and smiled and said Samurai, now that's heaven <laughs> that feeling you have in your heart now if you keep that on for day after day year after year, century after century that's heaven now you can understand what heaven and hell are you can experience them in this life but they're only temporary abidings in this life but if you incline towards them again and again and again and again and again, that's where you get reborn. But the most important thing is you get a taste of heaven and a taste of hell. Anger, revenge, hurting, getting your own back, that is the stuff of hell. That's why I say, yeah, hell does exist. If you've got ever, ever been really angry at someone, really upset, you're in pain. That's why I can't see why anybody really wants to punish others. You're just sentencing yourself to hell. You're putting yourself in a jail. You're being so cruel to yourself. You're hurting yourself. And it doesn't work. It's not useful. I don't know why people do that. Why do you get angry? It doesn't help at all. You can get much better. You can get your own way. If you want to get your own way, if you want to manip manipulate other people, you don't need to get angry. There's much better ways. And if you want some better ways, how to influence your husband, how to get the best out of your wife, you can come here and I'll tell you exactly to get your own way, whatever you want. It's very easy. Buddhist psychology, it really works. <laughs> Look at me. Every day, you wouldn't believe this. If I tell people in the world, they wouldn't believe this. Every day, people come to my monastery and give, them, give me the most delicious of food 
they actually bring the food to my monastery and also they wash up for me I've, as well. Now most people, if you invite someone to dinner, imagine you invite someone to lunch or to dinner and you tell them, please bring your own food and wash up afterwards. <laughs> That's what happens in our monasteries every day. <laughs> no, it's, but you see, why? It's because we're happy. And people like coming to our monastery. They like giving good things. They like hanging around, good monks and good nuns. This is how you get on the good side of people. And we're not doing this because we're devious, it's just because this is a nice thing to do. But the point is here, if you really want to get somewhere in life, if you really want to build good relationships, if you really want to get people to like you, if you really want people to be kind and caring to you, if you want good relationships in the world, anger, revenge, punishment, where does that lead you to? It brings you to hell and creates this terrible feeling in a family, in a community, in our world. That's why there's no way can there be any sort of person in any position of power and control who can actually just decide, okay, we're going to wipe out so many people, so many houses out of punishment because someone's been bad. That's not the way a wise person deals with someone who's bad. Anyone who's bad, I like saying that word, bad. Oops. Got a bit of crap. A bit of crap. Oh. I'm being punished for saying something wrong. <laughs> oh, it's still there. I just put my please excuse me. So <laughs> anyone who's, who's really bad, sort of that's not the, really the way to actually to solve the problem. The way to solve the problem is with a bit of kindness. There we are, leg. You be kind. See, it's worked again. <laughs> so if you a little bit of kindness, that encourages people, builds people up. So beings. In Buddhism we do have like powerful beings, but those powerful beings are mostly like kind beings, they're caring beings, they protect you, they don't go around hurting you. And if a person is like misbehaved, instead of actually going around and punishing you, you want to encourage a person who's misbehaved. So actually to tell them what they've done, encourage their goodness, forgive their badness, the old AFL code which we've taught here, acknowledge, forgive and learn what other people have done. That's where we build a good world, a wonderful world. Doesn't matter what another person has done to me, I'm not going to allow them to un take away my happiness. Doesn't matter how mean someone is, I'm always going to go and help them. And isn't that really inspiring? Now when someone's been really mean to you, but you go up there, and you go out, there, out your way to be kind to them. When I see examples of that, I see examples which really inspire. I don't know when the last time I told this story about... Oh, sometimes I love getting some stories from other religions because I think I've exhausted all the ones from Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> but this story from uh, Catholic Christianity of one of the, the disciples of St. Francis of Assisi. And this guy, he was... Actually, the Franciscan order is so similar to the Buddhist order. Now they all went for alms in the morning and they didn't have any money, not in the early days of uh, the Franciscan order. They lived so simply. They too wore brown robes and they had a bit of a shaved head I think, but not the full, the full, what's it called, the full Monty I suppose you call it. <laughs> well it's nude on the top anyway. <laughs> but any, anyhow, anyhow that, um, this guy he was going on arms round in the morning, was it six, seven hundred years ago in Italy or somewhere, and there was a poor beggar in the street, and the poor beggar asked for some, something to, to eat. The poor fellow was just really hungry. And so this, this monk, this friar, this Franciscan said, look, I haven't got anything. I don't have any money, I've got nothing to give you. And the fellow said, look, I'm really, really starving. And the monk thought, well look, the only thing I've got is my robe. And the beggar said, okay, that'll do. <laughs> so this monk gave him the robe he was wearing. And that's all he had. Now that is really generosity. Now don't you try that <laughs> <laughs> on one of my monks. <laughs> this is what he did. He gave the, literally the robe off his back. So when he went back to the monastery, he was completely naked. And the monks in the monastery said, get out of here, you know, you're a crazy person. 
So don't you remember me? I'm one of the monks. No, you're not. You're a new, I don't know what you are, a flasher or something. Get out. But soon they recognized him. It was this monk. He was one of their friends, one of the members of their community. So they said, okay, come inside. How come? Were you robbed or something and beaten up? You, someone stole your robe? He said, no. It was a really poor person I saw. And we're supposed to be generous. You know, we get gifts from others. Why can't we be generous back? So he gave the robe to this poor person. And all the other monks thought, my goodness, that really is a spiritual person. They don't think of themselves, they just think of that person needs something, so they just give it to him. And so they gave him another row from the stores and they were talking about him, what a great monk that is. The trouble is, you know what it's like, the beggar goes along and says, hey, this guy over here, he'll even give you a robe. So the word got around, and the next day he went out for arms round, someone else asked for his robe. So he gave that. And he came back to the monastery again, naked. This time they recognized him, oh, here he comes again. <laughs> And straight away they got this robe out the stores and gave it to him. It was probably just like Buddhism, it happened three times. After the third time when he came back naked, because he gave you know, this robe to this very poor person, they gave him a new robe for the third time and the abbot got him into his office. He said, now listen, it's all very well you know, to be kind, to be generous, but they're taking advantage of you. We've only got so many robes in the storeroom. Now don't do it again. And he really scolded this, this monk. This monk, you know, he hadn't done anything wrong. He was just being kind and generous. He was a bit, maybe a bit stupid or, you know, a bit soft in the head, a bit too compassionate, not enough wisdom, I don't know, but he hadn't done anything really wrong. But the abbot just really scolded him for over an hour. And the monk never tried to justify himself or defend himself. Now, this is really a wonderful person. This is why he's one of my favorite characters, you know, from this um, storybook. All he did, he put his head down, he listened and took the scolding. And then when the abbot was finished, he said, okay, you can go now. And he went away. And one hour later, he knocked on the abbot's door with a cup of soup. He said, what are you bringing me a cup of soup for? He said, oh, abbot, you were scolding me, you were shouting so hard, I'm sure your throat must be sore. Here, have some soup. <laughs> <laughs> And he was genuine. He wasn't trying to be clever or smart, Alec. This monk was just so compassionate, but never think of himself. Someone could scold him. He never even thought, you know, about yourself and all the rotten things someone was saying about you because you hadn't done anything bad anyway. All the time he's thinking, oh, this poor abbot, he's shouting so much. My goodness, you know, he mustn't have a sore throat. I'll go and make him some soup as soon as I'm finished. Wasn't that wonderful? I was really inspired. So. The next time your wife scolds you, just go and make her some soup. They've got this lovely cup of soups. <laughs> as soon as she's finished, go to the kitchen, make some soup. Here you are, darling. <laughs> you must have a sore throat. But don't pour it on top of her head. Just give it to her kindly. <laughs> now that's like real compassion and kindness. And of course, after that time, this abbot thought... How can you scold and get angry at such a, such a monk? It's just a waste of time. And he just said, okay, all the robes, you can go and give them away. I don't care. Can't stop monks like you. And that's actually the way to deal with abuse. You don't allow other people to sort of get you angry. And it's not punishment. How can you punish? So real powerful, really good people, they never get angry. That's why, you know, if there is a, a high being anywhere, there's a high being, they would never get angry and mean and show wrath to other people. It doesn't make sense to me. That's why the whole idea of a wrathful God just never made any sense. Even the idea of like karma being a punishment never made sense to me. Until someone actually started talking to me, said, listen, even karma, it's not like a punishment, it's like a learning. It's a teaching tool. And people actually, they don't. They're not punished. There's not someone up there saying, oh, you were bad, this is what's going to happen to you. A lot of people actually, and this is amazing, but it's true, choose to be in those situations. You may not see this, it may not be conscious to you, but sometimes we choose pain because of our guilt. Because I've you know, been in this business for a long time now, I know my own mind, I counsel other people. Sometimes someone's done something bad, they've done something very mean, they've hurt someone else. I think, well, why can't you forgive yourself? 
No, I, I forgive myself all the time. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> or my, all the old stories which I say again and again. I forgive myself every week, telling the old jokes again and again, so I don't care. <laughs> I never feel guilty. But I try and encourage other people who have done even worse things than I've ever done and say, oh, leave it alone. You know, actually, what really, one of the worst things I ever did, at least I thought it was the worst thing, it's amazing when we have guilt. Sometimes they're tiny little things which we've done, and for us it's a big thing. What was really hurted, hurt me for many, many years was that uh, when I was a student, you, you know, we had to have... And my father was already dead when I was at college, and so my mother was you know, not all that wealthy. So I used to get jobs in the vacations to support myself. And to buy all my, my Jimi Hendrix records, whatever else I used to buy, use my money for. But one day I got a job as like a door-to-door salesman selling encyclopedias. You know, one of the worst possible jobs you can ever get. But, you know, you were desperate, so you take anything in those days. So I was going around selling encyclopedias, and one evening I sold one. And I felt so guilty after that. I just, I just, I felt terrible. Because it was a kid's encyclopedia, and you were actually taught to actually to make the parents feel like they were just real mean and nasty, and they didn't love their children at all. And if they didn't buy this wonderful encyclopedia, that they were actually... If they didn't buy this amazing encyclopedia, they were depriving their children of a good education and a proper livelihood. And so, you know, this is what I did. And I was actually quite good at it, and I sold one to this lovely little couple. They were just you know, newly, ma- newly married, they just got a new house, and just had all these expenses, and they just had a baby, and here's this character come, me, sort of getting more money out of them for this stupid encyclopedia. Because I didn't, it was a lot of old rubbish in the encyclopedia. And I felt so bad afterwards. What did I do that for? Taking the money from these people. They could have used it for much better better means. And they were just such a soft and nice couple. And I felt so terrible. For years I felt rotten about that. And then here one night I told that story and someone came up to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, I don't know if it was you. Now, the chances are it's probably not. But you know, when I was a small kid, this guy came up to my door, knocked on the door, and he sold my mum and dad his encyclopedia. I love that encyclopedia. It was one of the best things I ever had. I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> and straight away I thought, well, it doesn't matter if it was me, but maybe that I was exaggerating my, what I did to other people. And certainly I felt much better after that, and I thanked that person, and it got rid of all my guilt. <laughs> It's amazing just how you have these small little things, you exaggerate and you, you get... Well, why couldn't I forgive myself a long time ago? I often inquire, why is that? And a lot of times it's because we're not wise, we're not smart, because we're actually attached to our, our bad actions. It is an attachment. Sometimes, you know, we talk about attachments in Buddhism, we always think attached to good things, you know, attached to things we like. But this, that's only half of attachments in Buddhism. It's not like attached to you know the food you like, or attached to your car, or attached to your children, or attached to you know your TV program, which you're probably recording if it happens on a Friday night, so you can come here. <laughs> that's not what we mean about. We also attach to the rotten things as well, to pain. It's a strange thing, human beings, but sometimes we are attached to what hurts us, and sometimes this is what guilt is. We've got it into our minds that we've done something wrong and we need to be punished. And it doesn't matter what any monk says, no matter what any friend or loved one, someone dearest to you said, let it go, forgive yourself. You will not do that. We want to be punished. That's why people have those experiences. They choose to take up the bad karma and be punished for it. It was an amazing revelation to me, actually, to see that hell, the doors of hell are always open. Anyone can walk out at any time, if they want to. The only reason you stay in a hell is because you don't allow yourself to leave. When someone's angry, you can drop that anger at any moment. You can just forgive. The reason why you can't forgive 
It's just you don't want to. When you have guilt or you know, something you've done, this guilt is just anger to yourself. You're allowed to forgive any time. There's no laws, either religious laws, spiritual laws, cosmic laws, let alone laws of the of the nation, which says you must hurt yourself because of what you've done. Any moment, any time, you can just say, enough, I'm going to forgive myself. To understand that is a huge insight. To understand it's all right to forgive oneself and others. It's a good thing to do. It really is a spiritual thing to do. And it's a very therapeutic thing to do. It's a beneficial to yourself, to your partnership, to your family and to the whole world. Because you know that because sometimes you do see great acts of forgiveness. It inspires you. You know one of those to saying today to someone else, those great acts of forgiveness, one of the greatest recent acts of forgiveness was Nelson Mandela. In jail for all those years. Came out of jail, I think a year later he was president. He had all the power and opportunity to get his own back. Now those people who put him in jail for, was it 26 or 29 years or something? It's a huge sentence. Basically for standing up for, you know, was protecting or uh, uh, challenging really gross abuse. But when he got out of jail, did he get his own back at his captors in, was it in Robben Island? Did he try and get his own back at those people who had prosecuted him? Took, taken away 26 years of his life. Imagine that. That amount of time. No, he forgave. Now that's something which is inspires us. He says, yeah, it's possible. And it's wonderful. It uplifts. Now if a human being can do that, well, how can there be any like cosmic beings who will punish? Of course, cosmic beings never do that. Any sort of person who's spiritually advanced is like this wonderful grandfather or grandmother. You go up to them and you say all the things you've done wrong and you know they'll never hurt or harm you at all. I remember as a young monk going to see one of these great teachers in Thailand. It was a monk called Ajahn Tate. Of all the monks of our tradition, I saw he was the one who had the behavior and the charisma of a saint. At that time, he was a great meditator, supposed to have psychic powers and all of that, especially he was supposed to be able to read your mind. And of course, at that time, I was only a young monk. I was not ready to have my mind read. <laughs> Certainly not in public. <laughs> so I was very scared when I went to see him for the first time. But it was one of those experiences, as soon as you went into the presence of such a being, all your fear disappeared. You felt this, this tremendous sense of love, of acceptance. I don't know if you've ever felt that. You realize that that being in front of you will never hurt or harm you in any which way. You feel that on a very deep level, intuitively, and you know how true it is. Once you get into the presence, you never want to leave. You just want to stay there. Just whatever I want to, just I'll just wash your feet for the rest of your your years, or do anything for you. Just don't throw me away, because it's wonderful being by with someone who gives you full acceptance. They'll never punish you or hurt you in any which way. And if you've had those sorts of experiences with someone. That's a spiritual experience. That pure love. You know, the door of my heart open to you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Never in any which way will I harm or hurt you. No revenge at all. No, no anger, no violence, but full openness and acceptance of you for who you are. With all your silliness, all your stupidity, all your own little faults and failings, just accepts completely. Those are the sort of experiences which actually told me just what the alternative to anger, punishment, force, coercion is. 
because that just got the best out of me. No way was I going to hurt a being like that. Even just, I told this in Singapore, I don't know if I told this here, even when I first went to, when I used to go to Canning Vale Jail, there was one time there where there had been a lot of violence in that jail against the visitors and the staff. Because some, this is actually when Fremantle closed down, sort of all the hard crims went to Canning Vale, I think before the other one down at Casuarina opened up. So there were some people in that jail, murderers and rapists, the tough guys, who were in there for such a long time that basically it didn't really make any difference. You know, if they kill somebody else or rape someone else, it doesn't really matter, they're probably going to die in jail anyway. So, they were fearless. And as it happened, that past month or so, there had been several attacks, not just on prison staff, but also on the visitors. People like me, who were just going into the jail to teach meditation or some sort of craft or art or something, were being attacked by the prisoners just for the hell of it. So the prison system there, the prison uh, system, had put in this warning system. They had uh, on the ceiling, they had these little, uh, they looked like um, like fire sprinklers along the whole prison. And they gave me this little like pen, like a little uh, uh, biro pen. And they said, put it in your label pocket. And I said, now come off it. I've been in this prison for a long time. I haven't got a jacket or a label pocket. <laughs> in all my robes, there is not one pocket. And they oh, crikey, there's a monk again. We always give a lot of trouble to people, being a monk. It's just like the time, I just read this in a book the other day, the time where I went into to hospital. It's actually, I was in the hospital many years ago, in Rockingham Hospital, only for six or seven days. And the first thing they asked me, where's your pyjamas? <laughs> and I said, I haven't got any pyjamas. See, so, you have to wear pyjamas in hospital. I said, listen, it's these robes or nothing. <laughs> we'll take the robes. <laughs> We create a lot of trouble for people. Sometimes it's my, my nature. I like to cause trouble sometimes. Anyway, but in this particular, <laughs> in this particular case, look, I haven't got any pockets, so they said just hold it. So I just hold this pen when I went inside. But they said this is top secret. None of the prisoners know about this because they knew about it. Won't be able to protect you. But if anyone jumps you, you see those uh, sensors on the ceiling. Just press the, the the top there. Aim it at the sensor. The alarm will go off, but also, most importantly, we'll know exactly where you are and we'll come and uh, rescue you. Thank you very much. So as soon as I went into my class, one of these crims I knew is a great guy. And, you know, he was one of the tough guys in the jail. He was the one who told me that when you actually you get into trouble and you get, um, uh, what's it called, solitary confinement. Because he was, he was one of my meditators, he was a very naughty prisoner, he was always getting into solitary confinement. He said, I was so disappointed, he said, when I got into solitary confinement for the first time. I thought, at last I can meditate, they can leave me alone. But he said, no, first of all they take off all your clothes, and then you're visited by the prison gu uh, superintendent twice a day, the psychologist three times a day, the senior staff twice a day. He said, oh, it's just more, so busy, it's not solitary at all. <laughs> it's just one of these names they give it, but it's not solitary, and he was just so disappointed. The solitary confinement was just so busy. <laughs> but anyway, he was a guy, as soon as I walked in, he sort of looked at my pen and said, oh, you've got one of those security devices as well. <laughs> That's what he said straight away. And of course, the crims knew all about what was going on. And then he was serious. He looked me in the eye. He's a big guy. He's this blonde-haired big guy. And he said, do you really think, Brahm, that you could even actually get your finger on the end of that pen before I jump you. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think I could. He said, yeah, you wouldn't have a chance. Even before you thought of it, we could grab you and, and rape you. But he said, don't worry, Bram. We like you in here. If any of these guys behind me tries that, I'll jump them first. <laughs> that was my security system. <laughs> My friends, because I was kind to people. Because I was kind to people, they wanted to protect me. And actually that's why when you have this kindness, it always stops more violence. Like gentleness, people don't walk over you. 
if you're really kind, when I saw that great monk, Ajahn Tate, I just, there's no way I would ever abuse such a beautiful being. So you don't need punishment. You need the opposite of encouragement, kindness, love, forgiveness. You forgive anything I said. I said I'd done the most stupid of things. said, oh, never mind, forgive it, never go, mind. Don't do it again, that's all. Well, I've done something really bad. Oh, it doesn't matter, let it go. There was this character in the time of the Buddha called Angulimala. All of you traditional Buddhists know this character. He killed 999 people, and that's a pretty big serial killer. I mean, who's that? There was that doctor in England that uh, who um, supposed this doctor killed so many old ladies. Dog ship. How many did he kill? Hundreds. Not as many. Nine hundred ninety-nine. There. So, so two hundred fifty. Yeah, that's nothing compared to Angulimala. So, <laughs> well, and it is, it is something. Even just one death, obviously, is something. But the point was, this this guy who killed nine hundred ninety-nine people. This bandit. And as soon as uh, you know, the Buddha saw him and converted him, just forgave him straight away. And he could forgive himself as well. It's amazing that even just that extreme of violence and hurt and harm to others, one could still let go and walk out of that prison of guilt. He became an enlightened being. He's a great inspiration for others. Even a person like that who's done such harm, can still forgive themselves and become completely free. Now, can you understand just what heaven and hell is? What the stupidity of punishment is? Thinking we can get the best out of another person by creating more pain in them, by taking away their comfort, by harassing them, by beating them, by even executing them. It does not work. I'm running out of time, but for those of you who want to read another inspiring story, in that little book which I wrote, Open the Door of Your Heart, is that story about those communist leaders, the bandits who killed monks, killed soldiers in Thailand just during the Vietnam War. Insurgents. When they, the leaders, the generals, the the Osama bin Laden, the, was it Che Guevara's of Thailand, the people trying to overthrow their country, the Pabakarans, when they gave themselves up. And the Thai government is one thing I'm very proud of them in this instant. They did not punish the leaders of this insurgency, which had been going on for about five or six years. And they'd actually, they were waging a war against the government of Thailand at the time. And actually, that for a while, they looked. They actually may actually win. They had all the support from the from Laos and from Vietnam and, and Cambodia, especially from Vietnam and from China as well. All their arms and money support. And a huge number of people. Many of the areas in Thailand were called pink areas. So, at that particular time, there were a huge threat. They killed many soldiers, many monks even when these leaders gave themselves up, they were pardoned, forgiven. But more than that, they were given these top jobs in the civil service, thinking that these people were motivated, resourceful, energetic, were willing to sacrifice themselves so much for a cause. Let's get them inside our government so they can use their energies and their skills not against us, but for us. It's a very beautiful way of like forgiveness, even on such a big scale. And the best part of the story was a couple of years ago, telling the story in Sydney, when the Thai consul of Sydney stood up and said, I'd like you to add something to that story. It's very true, that's what happened. Those leaders were all given top jobs. He said, now, and it's still the case, because the government hasn't changed. Two of those leaders, what he called radicals, are now ministers in the Thai government, as I speak. It's like, it's not maybe not quite the same, but it's, well, for the most Sri Lankans here, it's like getting some truce with the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka and giving Prabhakaran a job in the civil service 
in a few years' time, he becomes one of the ministers in the Sri Lankan government. That's what it was like. It's a wonderful thing to do. Forgiveness, inspiration, and let's make use of our resources rather than killing, maiming, or whatever. This is actually what happened in Thailand. What can happen in our world? So instead of punishing people, let's actually forgive, bring everybody on side, and let's work together. So anyone who says that these tsunamis were all some sort of punishment, I oh, can't accept that at all. What I can say is opportunities. And I think I mentioned this last week, great opportunities. And I'm not quite sure about you, I've seen this, all these amazing things happen over the last week. It's the fact, I think John Howard gave a billion dollars. It's amazing that you know, he could have the guts to do that. Good on him. Wonderful thing to do. And all these people, just this fundraising, that fundraising, and people aren't tired of fundraising yet, of looking after and caring. Some of my disciples in Singapore, they told me this morning, they uh, have got some old uh, shipping containers, you know the sort of the ports in Singapore, they're full of old shipping containers. They've got a few of them, they're going to be converting them into just accommodation units and shipping them over to Sri Lanka to use as uh, temporary homes for orphans, ready-made, um, not homes but shelters. And they're doing that as I speak. They're wonderful, just the ideas which people have to help and to serve. And so when you have like a tsunami, you don't look upon it as some punishment. You look upon it as part of life and the opportunity for everybody to pull together and do something good. I'm just inspired by the reaction of people to tragedy. So that's a Buddhist idea of you know, punishment and reward. Keep the rewards going. Focus on the positive side of it. Not only does that encourage more positive action in the world, gets rid of grief, anger and stuff like that, and we can become much better people. Rewarding the flowers, we're just leaving the weeds to rot. So, there we go, otherwise I'll be going on all night, and I'll be in big trouble. So, thank you for listening to the talk this evening. Okay. That's really just a sad, sad, sad. <laughs> Can I try it again? Put some energy into it. Sadhu. 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 That's much better. <laughs> Come on. You lazy mob. <laughs> okay, go. Off you go.